The Shivering Isles is easily my favorite DLC or expansion I've ever played. When you take my favorite game of all time and then add a 20 hour long expansion that improves on almost every aspect of the base game, you got what must be by default my favorite DLC of all time. And when I say improves on almost every aspect of the game, I'm not being hyperbolic. But we got a lot of ground to cover so let's just get right into this thing. A mysterious door has opened up in the middle of the Nibbin Bay near Braville, and upon swimming halfway across the bay and making landfall, we are greeted by all sorts of strange plant life and geography, or at least strange by Cyrodiil standards. At the fucked up looking door, we get a glimpse of what lays in store for us. I'd stay back from that door if I were you. Nothing that's gone in has come out right. I don't know where it came from, and I don't want to. Those who've gone in have come back out... wrong. I'm just here to warn folks to stay away. Look for yourself. Their brains are addled. Got no sense. Perfectly normal people went in there. And this is what's come out. Ha! It's your funeral. I'm just here to warn people, not keep them out. Go ahead in. I'll be here to clean up the mess when you come out. Intrigued, we step through. Yes, what can I do for you? I imagine you're here about the door. Yes, you have entered, and now you are here. Amazing, truly. I am Haskell, Chamberlain to the Lord Sheogorath. You approach the Shivering Isles. Through the door behind me lies the realm of Sheogorath, Prince of Madness, Lord of the Never There. Because my Lord wills it to be so. It poses no danger to Mundus. No compact has been violated. It is a doorway, an invitation. Perhaps you will accept it for what it is. We get the sense our boy Haskell here has been doing these introductions a lot as a fleet. As he himself says, the door is an invitation to any and all who may wish to enter. Intriguingly, he mentions that no compacts have been violated, referring to the Cold Harbor Compact that ordinarily forbids Daedric Princes from interfering with Mundus. So already we are seeing the story making use of the established Elder Scrolls lore to explain itself, adding more depth to the universe as a whole. This is not the last time we will see this, and I probably won't make mention of it that often, because the writers really tried to utilize the lore, and of course expand upon it, and I just don't feel like interrupting myself every time an example pops up. Haskell isn't convinced we aren't just another hapless adventurer whom the Isles will swallow whole. If we want to prove our worth to Lord Sheogorath, then we will have to make it to his palace in the capital city New Sheoth on the other side of the island. Of course, getting there won't be easy as we got a whole foreign realm full of crazy people and homicidal monsters wanting to swallow us whole. Oh, and we also got a 12 foot tall indestructible juggernaut guarding the only way into the Isles. Quite certain he has seen the last of us, Haskell vanishes beyond the door and the room just bursts into butterflies and flies away. The land of the Mad God immediately lives up to its name. It would be easy for me to go on and on about how strange it is, how cool and alien the land is, how beautiful and deadly everything is, how much I love the fact that they split the island into two distinct biomes for much added variety, and just… I could just go on for hours really. I won't though, I'll just let the game speak for itself. If you've been watching the other parts leading up to this, and of course if you've played the Shivering Isles, you'll immediately know just how different the Isles are compared to Cyrodiil. Different in a very good way, too. It's like they took the criticism that Cyrodo was very bland and boring to heart and just went, what would be the most interesting and unique place we can set an expansion in? I don't know, how about the Realm of Insanity? I really wouldn't be surprised if that's how it really went, because I can't help but feel like this expansion was in response to something. At a few junctions of the game, particularly with Haskell, the game will make mention of things that feel like a jab at the criticisms that I myself have made in this video series. It's a little surreal and just fucking brilliant, because they really nailed this locale. When it comes to any location in any Elder Scrolls game, I don't think anything quite compares to what Bethesda managed to do with the Shivering Isles. 
But continuing on, it's not long before we get to meet our first Shivering Isle residents in the city of Passwall. And oh boy, are they a bunch, all right. They should have listened to me. We'll be swimming in blood soon. Yuck. Let's go watch. Just as long as we don't catch any of their diseases. Adventurers always get strange diseases. Come on, it'll be fun watching them get knocked around up there. I'll lead, you'll follow. Just don't get any blood on me. We make it to the Gates of Madness, only to watch a group of adventurers get slaughtered by the Gatekeeper. Unfortunately, we gotta get through those gates, and the Gatekeeper has the keys sewn up inside him. Asking around Passwall leads us to the village hunter, who I can only describe as having a real affection for bones. I'm J-Red Ice Veins. Do you ever wonder why things look better without their skin on? For instance, you can only really see the bones when you take them out. You can hear them better that way, too. I want him dead. I need him dead. His bones are calling to me. Rumor has it you want him dead, too. If you're any good with a lockpick, we can help each other out. We can get into the gardens of flesh and bone. They say the gatekeeper's magical. I don't believe in magic, but I do believe in bones. And the best way to kill something is with the bones of its own. I can see the bones of a dead gatekeeper in the courtyard of the gardens. The door's locked, though. You'll pick that lock, and I'll collect the bones. Then I'll make some arrows, and we'll kill the gatekeeper. Sound good? After some creepy psychopath dialogue, we agree to help him on his quest to kill the gatekeeper. This simply involves breaking into the gardens of flesh and bone, killing some fat material for the bone man, and grabbing some bones from the dead gatekeeper so bone man can make us some bone arrows. It's going to take time for him to fashion these arrows, giving us some time to snoop around past while some more. Try not to cough on me. I need a bath. Doing so reveals an interesting tidbit about Romina, the crazy powerful and also just plain crazy mage who created the Gatekeeper. Every night she goes and visits the Gatekeeper to talk to him and gets all weepy and apparently her tears have an adverse effect on the Daedra bound inside the Gatekeeper. So we go drop by while she's having one of her nightly sob sessions and nab her tear soaked handkerchief like a true creep and squeeze out the tears into bottles to act as a poison against the Gatekeeper. I have to interrupt myself again here and just make mention about how the expansion in the first 15 minutes of us getting here is already encouraging us and rewarding us for exploring, talking to NPCs, and just going off the beaten path, even in its main quest. Once again, this is not an anomaly, and judging by how many things made me go, oh shit, I'm glad I poked around here, I never would have caught this little secret, I know there are 10 more secrets I didn't catch this playthrough. There were no quest markers leading me by the nose to learn about Realmina. I just happened to stumble upon it because I wanted to talk to the crazy people of Passwall and hear what crazy things they had to say. And that speaks volumes to the impact good dialogue can have on the drive to explore. At one point in the Mage's Guild quest, did we have a desire to talk to our fellow guildmates when there wasn't a quest marker over their heads? The answer is never. Just another thing Bethesda seemed intent on changing in the expansion. We meet back up with Bone Man, who's got the arrows, and with them, we are ready to take down the big boy. Using his mother's tears and the bone arrows, we take him down right quick, and then it's a matter of grabbing the keys and heading through the gates of madness. Haskell materializes to patronize, I mean congratulate us, but insists our work has only begun, and we still need to actually make it to New Sheoth. We have two doors we could go through, one leading to the vibrant and deadly land of Mania, and the other leading to the dark and also deadly land of Dementia. Both lead to New Sheath, but both will provide very different experiences befitting their climate. Haskell tells us that in the Shivering Isles, choices matter, which, like I said, is one of those moments where Haskell is knocking on the fourth wall a little. 
I opt to take the road through Mania as it would probably look better on camera and because I always go through Dementia as it is my personal favorite of the two. I don't have problems or anything, I, I, I swear. The road to New Shayath is as welcoming as to be expected, that is to say, it isn't. But you're ambushed constantly along the way by nightmarish monsters that attack with frightening ferocity and will constantly stunlock us, poison us, or just deplete our health with alarming speed. Thanks to the virtues of level scaling, coming to the Isles as a higher leveled character as I prefer to do makes it into a challenging post-game segment that turns a lot of what we've come to expect from Oblivion on its head. Enemies have more robust fight patterns and are more difficult to cheese and use a variety of attacks and spells that make having an equally as varied arsenal of spells, weapons, and defenses a benefit and not a pointless exercise like in Cyrodiil. All in all, while the creatures of Cyrodiil were some of the dullest enemies in the game, the creatures of the Shivering Isles are challenging, frightening, and fun to fight. Navigating the land itself is most certainly interesting, but strangely more restrictive than Cyrodiil. There's tons of hills and mountains all over the place that create obvious paths through the landscape that serve to connect points of interest. While you can fairly easily hop out of these valleys, especially with high speed and acrobatics, doing so will serve to get you very lost, and more times than not make you think you've accessed a place that developers never intended on letting players see. It's a strange level design philosophy that really doesn't mesh with the navigational cues we've picked up from Cyrodiil. Over there, you really could pick any direction and just start walking in that way, and generally hit no obstacles. You'll probably leave the comfort and safety of the main roads, but it will never feel like you're heading into restricted areas of the game map itself. In the Shivering Isles, that just isn't the case, and in media more so than dementia. The landscape is also very difficult to read for finding paths and roads, and so even if you're making a concerted effort to stick to the routes after realizing venturing too far off of them is hazardous to your actual sanity, you'll find yourself quite often veering off course anyway, particularly when following quest markers. It doesn't ruin the experience and in a way helps make the Isles feel larger, but it's something anyone traversing the land will notice, especially coming from 50 hours in Cyrodiil. My journey through Mania was mostly uneventful, aside from the constant enemy ambushes that were serving to condition me towards the more challenging combat of the Isles. I did stumble across a camp where this fringe mage was in possession of a book that talked about the various ruins across the Isles. It's one of those rare times where an in-game book did just the right amount of world building to explain what might seem like a plot hole, foreshadow future story reveals, and leave the player with more questions than they had before finding the book. This book immediately had me looking through bookshelves in the aisles for anything I didn't recognize from Cyrodiil in the hopes they would be just as enlightening. The book points out that all the ruins around the aisles date back to older eras that each ended with a realm destroying apocalypse of sorts. The author reveals that according to his research and calculations, the next apocalypse could be any day now. The book isn't dated or anything, so it just as easily could have belonged to a previous era. But the fact that it is in possession of a zealot mage in the woods hints that at least these crazed mages believe it to be true. We finally make it to the City of Madness, and like the rest of the world, it is split into two distinct cities. The Manic City of Bliss and the Demented City of Crucible. In Bliss, we meet more colorful NPCs, one of whom is terrified of falling asleep because he believes the walls might fall on him while he's sleeping. He asks us to find a place for him to sleep at night, outside and away from any walls. In doing so, we meet the first person in the Isles who seems to still have all of his faculties. He insists he isn't crazy and he doesn't belong in the Isles, but that only begs the question of why he's still here then. What does this say about the player then? Are we the only sane ones here, or are we the craziest of them all? Anyway, the not crazy what elf, once convinced this isn't some trick, agrees to exchange his bedroll outside with Wallman's indoor bed. The reward ends up being just a scroll that would be very situationally useful, but considering the quest took all of about two minutes to complete, I can't complain. We make it to the palace of Sheogorath and enter the throne room, and the interior design of the place creates the impression that all roads lead straight to this one man, or god, demon, entity thing that chooses to look like a man. Well, all roads and all things lead to Sheogorath, and all things flow from him. This is his realm, and there's no question about that. Respect him, or else. It turns out Haskell does not own a monopoly on all the patronizing in the realm, as Sheogorath is slow clapping as we approach and informs us that we are the first mortals to make it this far, and, well, that has to count for something, right? He has certain designs for us, but we aren't ready to hear it all just yet. Though it does involve stopping the Great March, whatever that is. He's got some errands he needs us to run, one of which is getting the Fortress of Zedalian operational again. It's a place where unwanted visitors to the Isles used to be sent before the Gatekeeper was created. 
but seeing as we just slayed the gatekeeper to get in, that's not really an option, and Shergorth insists there are certain types he does not want having free access to the Isles. This first introduction to Shergorth is really quite something. It's one of those standout conversations that still burn into my brain from the first time I played this expansion over a decade ago. In fact, most of Shergorth's disturbing and amusing lines have really stuck with me, partly because they were just great lines, and partly because he's the only character in Oblivion who seems to have any sense of humor. Moments of levity and humor are far and few between in this game, but the writers definitely had some fun with Shergorth, finding what I believe is the perfect balance between pure madness, scatterbrained tangents, unsettling homicidal machinations, and moments of true clairvoyance. At no point do I find myself questioning why the Isles are the way they are, or doubting that a place such as this could or would function the way it is presented. Had they made him a total nonsensical moronic asshat like, say, Peter Griffin, I would never have been able to believe he could actually manage a realm as diverse and intricate as the Isles. Had he been too logical and clear-headed, well, then why would he be called the Mad God? On the surface, writing a character like Shergorath seems like it would be easy, and while technically I guess it would be pretty difficult to fuck him up too much, it's still not an easy task to get him exactly right either. And I think they did get him just right because he never ever becomes obnoxious, which is the biggest concern to be had when writing a crazy off-the-walls character. He doesn't overstay his welcome, and his dialogue is probably some of the most nuanced we see in the entire game. It's fucking crazy that the God of Madness is the most elegantly written character in this game, but it is what it is. Shergorth is awesome. Moving on. We get scooted off to Zedillion, and it's here we get our first real dungeon diving experience in the expansion. And, keeping in line with everything else so far, it's quite an improvement over its Cyrodelic counterpart. The Shivering Isles only employs two types of dungeons. Shivering Isle Ruins, which are like if Imperial Forts and Alien Ruins had a baby, and Underground Root Systems, which are just much more interesting cave systems. Some of these fortress complexes can be incredibly large, with tons of branching, interconnecting corridors. These corridors are loaded with traps, treasures, secrets, and of course, plenty of monsters. They all tend to be quite large, especially when compared to some of the ones in Cyrodiil, and more attention and care was put into the designs. But they still use the kit-like systems that allowed the devs to stitch them together, still making them feel more artificial and maybe even pre-generated as opposed to handcrafted. They're fine when measured in small doses, and thankfully that's exactly what the main story does for the most part. But that's jumping ahead, we gotta get Zedillion up and running first. The objective of this quest is quite simple, but once again, an improvement over what we saw previously. A group of Grumites has moved into Zedillion since it fell into disrepair, and the grubby little monsters have yanked the power crystals from their pedestals and turned them into religious staves. We gotta cleanse the place of their presence, take back the crystals, and retune the giant obelisk that acts as a beacon of sorts that attracts intrepid adventurers to Zedillion in the first place. Grumites are interesting for several reasons. First, they are a lot like goblins in Cyrodiil. In fact, they are almost identical to goblins, except that they are more fun to fight. They use lots and lots of poisons and are very wily in movement. Most of them don't have a ton of health, but they can mess you up, especially if they start ganging up on you. But what's more interesting is that they seem to have a sort of tribal proto-civilization going on. They have a religion with these cool-looking totems, and sometimes you might find statues of them in the wild. I'm assuming they built them because why the fuck would people make statues of monsters? They also have a class system of sorts, and they make their own weapons and shields. There's probably some lore in the game explaining them further, but it's nice that even on the surface we're getting an enemy that has more care and attention given to him. Unfortunately for them, that doesn't stop us from purging them from the halls of this facility. So, with their numbers decimated and their religious artifacts violated, we have ourselves an adventure mousetrap once more. Just in time too, because we got a party coming in to answer the siren call of the obelisk. The dungeon master, who has been presumably sitting in these dungeon ruins for who knows how long waiting for Shergorath to light the place up again, gives us a crash course on how this place runs and why it exists. He tells us it's designed to attract people of a certain spirit. A spirit deemed unfit for the Isles. And it basically dooms them to being either killed or rehabilitated into insane freaks that would be more of a fit for permanent residency in the Isles. This answers some key questions about the Isles, specifically, how the hell all these people got here, and why are they all so batty? I mean, it's unrealistic to assume all these people went through Zedillion, especially since this place hasn't been up and running in quite a while, but it at least answers how some of them got here. But the problem is that you don't want to have just anyone coming into the Isles, especially ones that might be too greedy or exploitative to live in harmony with the soft-minded citizens of the Isles. So, Zedillion acts as a filter of sorts. 
What I like is that Bethesda actually took the time to answer these questions. I kinda stopped prodding the world of Oblivion that much just because the quests never really bothered to answer even the most basic questions and motivations of characters. So when I got to the Shivering Isles I was expecting more of the same and I would have given it a pass just because, well, hey, the landscape is more interesting. But they did take the time to come up with answers to questions players might actually have, and they worked those answers into a valid, logical, and unobtrusive way. The quest isn't a search for the deep and nagging question of why do these people live here. It just happens to give us that answer along the way. Anyways, it's time for us to deal with these adventures, and that doesn't actually mean running down there and killing them. No, Zedillion is meant to play with its victims, and each of the three chambers has two different options we the player are presented with a manic choice, and a demented choice. The manic choices are meant to drive the party insane, and the demented choices are meant to be rid of them in a more conventional way. Despite my inclination to all things demented in this game, I much rather prefer the manic choices in Zedillion. The first chamber lets us pump gas into the room, which basically has the party hallucinate that a tiny enemy grows to five times its original size and chases them around the chamber until one of the members goes insane. The second chamber has a giant locked cage full of treasure, and upon noticing the lock, a mountain of keys falls from the ceiling, and the greedy mage goes crazy believing the real key is somewhere in the pile. Too bad none of those keys fit the lock! <laughs> the final chamber lets us trick the orc warrior into thinking he's dead when he has an out-of-body experience and sees his unconscious body on the floor. When the illusion wears off, he snaps, thinking he's now dead. What all of these have in common is that all three crazy party members at the end sound exactly like what I have come to expect from the citizens of the Isles. Had I run into a Breton talking about giant monsters chasing him around, a Dunmer obsessed with finding the right key, or an orc who is convinced he is dead, I would not think for a second these characters are out of place in this game. So yeah, I think it's safe to say Zedillion more than lives up to its intended purpose. The DM thanks us for our help and lets us take some of the loot from the party. One item in particular is a sort of great power called Duskfang, or Dawnfang depending on the time of day, because this weapon changes with the day. And not only that, it also drinks the blood of its slain foes to power up, and just looks fucking awesome. Once again, Bethesda went above and beyond with trying to make the unique items of the Shivering Isles actually unique, and fitting with a land of madness. Even though the item did technically come from Cyrodiil. It also comes with a neat little backstory told to us through the Orc's Journal. As we are heading out, we find these strange white obelisks, much like the ones we've seen in the fort and elsewhere in the Isles, rising out of the ground around us. With them spawn similar looking knights of order who say nothing and only make ear splitting growls that sound like someone banging trash can lids with cooking pans when they are damaged. They fight with no regards for themselves, each other, or anyone else. They're just empty killing machines, it would seem. The DM says as much, telling us that these knights of order are attracted to the obelisks, which makes sense why they would show up when we switched on the resonator that powers a Dillion. Regardless, he's very concerned and urges us to inform the mad god at once. We do so and he's not very surprised. He tells us that they are the minions of the Daedric Prince Jigalag, and their arrival signals the beginning of what's known as the Grey March, which is an apocalypse of sorts that happens at the end of every era, which just so happens to be right now. We are going to stop him, or at least that's what Shergorth is hoping. He's vague on the details, but he's no fan of Jigalag ruining his realm, that's for sure. To the end of wanting us to stop Jiggy, Shergroth wants us to go around and get acquainted with the two halves of the realm and the people living in it. And in another moment of unexpected self-awareness, Shergroth says he can't expect us to save the realm if we don't understand it. And maybe if we understand it, we'll understand why it should be protected. We hop on over to the other side of the palace, the darker side, where Syl, the Duchess of Dementia, resides. We find her alone, pacing around her throne room, and upon approaching her, she greets us in the most delightful manner. Her paranoia is almost as charming as her threats, and she tasks us with hunting down a conspiracy she is convinced exists, but has absolutely no evidence of it existing. I mean, with the way she has treated us in the first 10 seconds of meeting her, I'd be hard-pressed to believe there isn't a conspiracy against her, too. She grants us the title of Grand Inquisitor, which is an ominously vague title perfectly suited for an ominously vague task. She pairs us up with Herdier, the court torturer, because of course the Court of Dementia has an official office for that task. And then, channeling her inner Stalin, she reminds us that if no conspiracy is found, we will be the ones held responsible. So on it is to play this game of hot potato until someone is caught holding the blame when Syl loses her patience. Down in the dungeons we get to meet Herdier, and well, he may be my favorite character yet, aside from the mad god on Haskell. 
Immediately sensing a deep-rooted connection, he and I go on a little trip together to go loosen some tongues. Please, no! Please, no! Please, no more. Walk with our Lord. No, no, I, I, I don't know anything about anything. I, I'm sorry. I can't help you. Please, no. I don't know anything about a conspiracy. No, please, no. The young folk just don't appreciate a good stick anymore. Shouldn't tease me like that. I hope you'll trip and fall on a sword. Please, no more. I'm afraid I have no idea what you are talking about. Please, no. You may continue to do your worst, Inquisitor. Ah. No, please, no. Ah. I don't know anything about a conspiracy. Please, no! Please, no more! Pleasure and pain be with you. I don't know anything about a conspiracy. Please, no. Please, no more. I don't... No, please, no. After having burnt to a crisp several people in the court and in town, there is, in fact, a conspiracy against Syl. Who would have thought? The conspiracy involves quite a few people, and some of whom are quite close to Syl. We have to crisp a couple more people, eavesdrop in a secret meeting between an informant we managed to flip in one of Syl's bodyguards, find the informant dead a few hours later, and then finally confront the guard with evidence of her guilt. She's not very convinced, but throws the head of the conspiracy, Murine, under the bus anyhow. She says we are going to need solid proof to make her fess up, but upon directly confronting her, she fesses up immediately. But not before saying her piece about how Syl deserves to die a painful death for consorting with the enemies. Whatever that means. Broken Clock Syl is delighted to have the conspiracy uncovered, or maybe she's just delighted to have someone to finally torture. In any case, she has Murine taken to the dungeon, where she is given a concentrated dose of what me and her dear have been dishing out the past few days and then thanks us for our work, but not before reminding us of what happens to those who betray her. She also gives us a nice enchanted bow that will use a random effect each time it hits something. Perfect for keeping your enemies on their toes. Dementia has a few worthwhile side quests to get into. The first and my personal favorite is helping a citizen of Crucible kill himself. You see, taking your life in Shivering Isles is a terrible crime according to Shergorath. So, if someone was to do that, they would be damned for all eternity to be reborn on the hill of suicides as a ghost, forever plagued by their torments. Here's Clotumnus has no desire to endure that fate, so he basically hires us to kill him, circumventing the suicide penalty. He warns us that he doesn't want to see it coming because, well, he's a bit of a coward, but he also recommends we make it look like an accident unless we want to be charged with murder. While waiting for death to come, he will continue on his day as though nothing has changed. It's up to us to follow him around and find the right opportunity to do him the favor and mercy kill him. That opportunity comes when he goes up to the top of a tall staircase leading to the palace on the edge of town. He likes to come up here because the view helps him forget his depression, and that's when we give him the push he's been waiting his whole life for. Someone really ought to put up a railing. That happens all the time. We inherit his house on the Ring of Happiness, a macabre little reward for a quest that I probably appreciate more than is healthy. 
Outside of town is a village called Falmor, where a high elf more or less has enslaved two Khajiits to work the bog pits of her farm. It's a dingy place where we see two Khajiits working and occasionally causing headaches for their taskmaster. We learn the female Khajiit is just a crazy liar who spouts all manners of nonsense, and eventually, once we've earned her trust with enough illusion magic, will give us a spoon to give her husband as he will trust us and tell us what needs to be done. Her husband is another paranoid crazy type, and once we've given him his beloved spoon he'd been looking for, he lets us in on the big secret. He believes their master has some mind reading ability and is planning to murder him and his wife, and that's why they continue to work for her. He wishes for us to free them both by sealing her notebook where she writes down all of their thoughts all day long, and then go and trash her house because that would drive her totally insane. Upon chatting with the taskmaster and reading her notebook, I don't think she needs any more help going insane. She, uh, she seems to be already there. Regardless, we do what the cat wishes, returning to him once it's all done. We then go into the house to find his former master having a mental breakdown, and that's the end of the quest. So fucking strange and random, and acts as a reminder to never take your grip on reality for granted. Uh, we also get a nice ring with reflect spell and resist magic buffs. The final Dementia side quest has us traveling to a rumored-to-be-haunted castle on the far-flung spit of land on the edge of the Isles. Vytharn is absolutely haunted, as ghostly soldiers continuously replay a battle for the now crumbling and sinking ruins of the keep. It's a very eerie locale and an entire realm that is eerie and unsettling. Upon entering the keep, we meet the ghost of the Count of Vytharn, and it's here that two things can happen. Either we can tell him we mean him no harm, and he proceeds to tell us the story of the keep and why these ghosts are all over the place, or we insult him by telling him we wish to lift the curse on the place. Ten bucks to whoever can guess the dialogue option I accidentally chose. But you know what, I'm kinda glad I messed this up, because picking the insulting option has the count locking us in the keep and forcing us to figure everything out on our own. We are given no quest markers or really any hints, and it's up to us to piece the whole thing together and find a solution to this ghost problem. This is probably the one and only time a dialogue option I haphazardly selected in Oblivion came back to bite me in the ass. At no point in Oblivion did any dialogue option carry any consequences at all, and then comes along this quest where, upon picking the wrong option, we are locked in with all these ghosts and are forced to figure out the puzzles to free ourselves and the ghosts. And that alone makes this quest noteworthy. So we gotta go around exploring every nook and cranny of the keep and the bailey outside where we find the battle of the keep is on repeat. This is probably the only quest in this game that actually made me think a little bit. I refused to use guides for any quest in Oblivion that I wasn't convinced wasn't bugged out, so it took me a few minutes to get it all figured out. Eventually I realized that I had to prevent the defending ghosts from fleeing the battlefield, which meant tracking down key items that were important to their morale or their combat effectiveness. The elf archer didn't have her arrows because the blacksmith was a dick who kept them locked up during the battle, so we brush off our thieving skills and swipe them from the armory and return them to her. Another defender was really concerned about his beloved doll, so we swipe it and burn it in one of the braziers lying around and make him focus on the battle. I don't really know how doing that's supposed to help the guy, but okay then. Then we have the mage who runs out of magicka and needs a source of more if he's going to remain on the field. We could either give him a welkin stone, which he can use to pump up his mana, or we can give him a dagger that sucks all the magic off from whoever he slashes. Ten bucks to whoever guesses correctly which one I accidentally gave him. With the three now committed to the replaying battle, the Count finally gives us a scoop on what's going on. He admits that the falling of the keep was partially his fault as he fled the field, and the whole reason of the curse was because they were plotting against Shea Gorath a long time ago. In helping them finally defeat the attackers, the Count is convinced that we can break this curse. Thanks for the tip, finally. I mean, he would have given this to us if we hadn't insulted him at the gates, but eh, whatever. To make up for his cowardice, he gives us his helmet to go into battle wearing, and in doing so we will clear him of his crime of cowardice. So we put it on and head out to the courtyard where we slay a ghost and free everyone from the curse. The Count thanks us, letting us keep the helmet as our reward, and that's the end of the quest. The helmet is pretty decent for heavy armor users, but the real treat is the quest itself. I did not expect to get roped into a quest that sets up some puzzles and gives us few hints and no quest markers. It's not crazy challenging or anything, but damn if it's not a fresh of breath air in a game that really holds our hand way too firm most of the time. Oddly enough, I find the keep much creepier once the ghosts are all gone. Even though I now know the true story of it and just help lift the curse on it, making it a safer place, the lack of NPCs in the rainy foggy swamp really makes the keep feel even more haunted without all the transparent NPCs around. 
it's probably time to put dementia aside for a while and get a little manic. Over on the other side of New Shayoth, we are meant to get a taste of Mania, and Thaden, the Duke of Mania, means to take that quite literally. He wants us to find the Chalice of Reversal, which he says helps make eating Faldu good, because consuming Faldu without the Chalice is bad. Like, really bad. Faldu helps open the mind for creative thoughts, and so he wants the Chalice so he can go back to using it. Unfortunately, he and Syl had a falling out after they had a passionate and potentially quite scandalous fling and that resulted in the chalice being hidden away. Before he gets to tell us the rest of the details, he says he's got a headache and he needs to go lie down. Don't worry, I know what that's like all too well. The appropriately named Wide Eye in Thaden's court is able to give us just a few more details, but doesn't want to tell us too much because, as she puts it, Thaden wants us to experience something and she doesn't want to spoil that surprise. Whatever it is, it's going to be unpleasant to some extent, and this just delights Wide Eye. These people are starting to sound like Dementids right about now. She does tell us the chalice is in Dunroot Burrow, and the Elytra's Feldu, which we must consume in order to get in, is all part of that learning experience. So, it's off to go eat some green shit dropped by giant bugs in the middle of the woods, and wouldn't you know it, Feldu is incredibly addictive. We are hooked after just the first bite, and the only way to reverse the effects is with the chalice, which now makes sense why Thaden wants it so badly. So, being hooked on the Feldu, we got no choice now but to continue on through the root system, slaying Elytra for our Feldu fix. The dungeon experience itself would be a little bland if it wasn't for this little twist, but because the game mechanics now have us acting like desperate addicts, this quest winds up being one of the more memorable ones in the game. Even with our stupid high luck skill, the Feldu only drops just enough to make it to our next dose, leading me to think that this quest is just scripted this way. If we can't get enough Feldu, we go into a draw and start suffering some unpleasant stat debuffs. And considering these Elytra are pretty aggressive enemies, those stat debuffs can become quite deadly. After carving a path through the cave systems, we eventually come to the Sanctum of Decadence, where cults of Feldu addicts live in perpetual bliss, consuming tons of Feldu and using the Chalice of Reversal to stem off the negative effects. Naturally, they don't approve of us crashing their party and wanting to be off with their Chalice, so they attack us, but they're not really much of a match for us, and really nothing compared to the Elytra we've been fighting up until this point. We grab the Chalice and it's off back to Thaden. Thaden is a great contrast to the demented Syl. While Syl ruled with fear and subterfuge, Thaden rules from people loving and needing him, though not in the good way, more like the uh, obsessive and creepy sort of way. While Syl was very, very concerned about what everyone else was doing and thinking, or not doing and not thinking, Thaden is completely aloof to everyone and everything else. He seems to just like his drugs and his art, and even we seem to hold his interest for a little more than a few fleeting moments. These two have more going on for them than even the biggest names we met back in Cyrodiil, and our time spent interacting with them was probably only about five minutes collectively. Unfortunately, there just aren't many quests related to the manic side of the realm. Most of them are just quick 5 minute conversations with crazy NPCs that yield little reward aside from the dialogue. One is noteworthy not because the NPCs are crazy but because they are all sane. In the settlement of Hale lives a former knight from Cyrodiil who came to the Shivering Isles believing a serious threat lay inside when the portal opened in the Niven Bay. After exploring a while and being ambushed by some Grumites, he came across Hale and met his now fiance Zoe. He explains how he no longer has any desire to return to the chaos of Cyrodiil as he's found some inner peace in the Isles, and of course, met his love. It's strange that a realm of madness would offer a former knight a place to find himself and live in peace, but that's what he tells us. His fiancée Zoe is just as clear-minded as he is and enjoys passing the time painting. I really can't blame either of them for not wanting to leave this place, they got a really nice life together here. You know, assuming the Grey March doesn't exterminate them, but no place is perfect, I suppose. I'm not really sure what to make of this settlement of sane people in the Isles. Perhaps it's meant to just show that not everyone living in the realm has to be crazy. But also, how did the knight manage to get past the gatekeeper? Certain things are just left unanswered here and it does the world no favors by introducing plot holes. It's a tiny side quest though and a rather dull dungeon dive to retrieve his medallion from the Grumites that ambushed him. Definitely the sort of quest that I'd grown used to in Cyrodiil, and proving that Bethesda didn't quite make this expansion flawless. Oh well, moving on. A lot of the side quests in the Shivering Isles are more like scavenger hunts more than anything else. One resident in Bliss wants us to collect tongs and calipers, both are abundant junk items, and will pay us some gold for each pair we bring. Another quest has us looking for odd and unique items to fill a museum in Crucible. These items are things like pieces of amber ore shaped like Sheogorath, a ring that will strip the wearer of everything they have equipped, and the pelvis bone of the Emperor Pelagius the Mad. 
another just has us collecting two types of ores unique to the Isles and weapon and armor molds, then bringing them to a couple of smiths to get unique weapons and armor made with the materials. There's really not a whole lot to be said about any of these quests, but I do appreciate how they encouraged me to do some exploration and pay extra attention to the dungeons I was hitting for certain quests, because you never really knew where these things might turn up. The base game probably would have benefited more from a few quests like this, aside from collecting relatively useless Nern roots, but, but let's get back to Shergarth and report our progress. We've been off track long enough. We are finally ready to hear what Shergarth has planned for us. We are simply meant to replace him on the throne when Jigalag comes to destroy the realm, because every time he comes, Shergarth has to disappear, leaving the realm completely undefended. Will we become a Daedric Prince? Not exactly, but we will wield a considerable amount of power, enough to stop Jigalag, hopefully. It's simple, really, so long as we don't ask too many questions just yet. But first, we gotta put the people of New Shaoth's minds at ease. The Flame of Agnon burns above the temple in the city as a beacon of hope and a sign of Shergarth's divine power. Every time the Grey March begins, the torch goes out. This tends to make the people nervous and they begin defecting to the side of order. Shergarth wants to prevent that as much as possible, and the easiest first step is to keep that torch lit. In order to do that, we need to travel to the source of the flame, Silarn, the oldest site of ruins in the Isles, and rumored to be the original capital of the realm. It also happens to be the site where the Dark Seducers and Saints are locked in perpetual combat, always competing for control of the place in an attempt to become Shergarth's favorite creations. Shergarth doesn't really give a damn about their struggle for his attention, but he does care about that flame, so it's off to Silarn so we can keep him from getting upset and swallowing our soul. Upon arrival, we find two forces locked in a stalemate, with both sides occupying a key part of the ruins. In order to get the flame in the courtyard lit, we need to choose to help one side in order to tip the scales in that side's favor and uproot the other. I opted for the Dark Seducers because I'm all about Team Dementia. And then it's just a matter of standing our ground as the saints come to us and we hold tight. Once the main commander of the opposition is slain, it's just a matter of strolling to their side and claiming the altar, sacrificing the victorious commander upon that altar, lighting ourselves with the cold flame of Agnon in the courtyard above, and making it back to the Sasalem of Arden Sul and Nusheoth. Our picking sides doesn't end at Silarn, as there are two torches we can light in the temple, each one representing one of the sides of the city, naturally. The respective preachers wish for us to light it in their sides as honor, but considering we just purged Cylon of the Golden Sates, it's only fitting to make that a total conquest for Dementia by lighting the green fire. We get awarded a set of enchanted clothes befitting a friend of the Demented, and it's quest complete. It's a relatively short quest, but it's pretty cool getting some more insight into the two sides of the realm, and the Daedric forces that defend it, all the while getting to make some actual decisions that, while not affecting the world a whole lot, still makes more of an impact and is more interaction than we got with anything during the main quest in the base game. But onto the next task. Shergarth insists we need to hold some legitimate power in the realm if we are going to be accepted as the new Shergarth. To that end, we need to replace either the Duke of Mania or the Duchess of Dementia, which kinda sucks for them, but whatever, it is what it is. This isn't going to be as simple as it might seem, as there's rules and rituals that dictate these things, and our first order of business is learning them. Upon inquiring with the priests at the temple, we learn that in order to become the next Duke of Mania, we must have the current Duke consume large amounts of a drug known as Green Moat until his heart explodes. And then we take his drug-tainted blood to the altar in the temple. In order to replace the current Duchess of Dementia, we must carve out Sil's heart and bring it to the altar in the temple. Either way, it's a real rough deal for the current ruler. In keeping with the spirit of things thus far, I'm opting to replace the Duchess of Dementia, also because I've never actually done this one before. We head on over to the Court of Dementia, where the throne is empty. Upon asking her aides, we learn Scylla is now in hiding as she fears she has lost the favor of the Mad God, whom she now thinks wishes her replaced. Once again, Broken Clock Scylla is right, but this time there will be no way for her to torture her way out of this conspiracy. Her aides agree to flip to our side and we press deeper into the palace only to find her body on the bed already. Her aide insists though that this is just a body double she likes to deploy in order to throw off would-be assassins, and that she must have slipped down the secret escape tunnels in the courtyard to her underground fortress designed to ambush the ambusher. The next dungeon crawling segment is ceaseless ambushes mixed with dodging traps like these damage dealing statues, an appropriate place for the rule of the demented to have access to. Her guards are understandably on high alert, and it takes quite a bit of time and battling to finally make it to Syl, who is now armed and armored and ready for a fight to the death. Unfortunately for her, she's up against someone who has more titles than any king or emperor back in Mundus, and her seat of power is merely another title we the player will possess on our road to having the grandest title yet. It really sucks to be Syl, but I was surprised she even had a heart to take. Doubt she will really be missed all that much. 
Back at the temple, we burn our heart to be awarded the Duke of Dementia, only to learn that there is, in fact, a single person in this realm who would actually miss that crazy sadistic lady. Her former lover and Duke of Mania, Thaden, confronts Sheogorath over the sanctioned assassination or replacement of his beloved Sylph, all performed by a mortal outsider, no less. Thaden, possessing more backbone than I thought possible from the little wood elf junkie, defies the Mad God and abandons his post. Outright stating he's gonna go work for Jigalag because what Sheogorath is doing is too crazy even for him. Sheogorath lets the former Duke go and tells us not to pay the falling out too much mind. This is just to be expected in times such as this, and seeing as this has never actually happened before, this might mean his plan is actually working. Thaden informed us that the Order had taken the fringe, and this is the thing Sheogorath wants us to worry about next. We need to head off their advance there if we want to stop them from breaking into the rest of the aisles and sweeping through it. So, it's back to the fringe where we came through a little while earlier as the naive, wide-eyed adventurer. And well, you should know at this point how much I enjoy these return to where you started tropes. The fringe is looking a lot worse for wear these days though, as Order has stripped almost all signs of life in the region, aside from the few seducers left fighting for their lives in the abandoned site of Passwall. After fighting off a few waves of knights, we learned that the tower that had been just another enigmatic fixture of the town for years is actually acting as some sort of portal for these invaders. We need to gain access to it through the ancient ruins of Zedaphin, which are now accessible thanks to the deforestation efforts of the side of Order, whom apparently just hate anything colorful and lively. So that's where we head to next, fighting more knights along the way. In the ruins, it's another bog-standard dungeon run that have just become too commonplace in this game to really present anything worth discussing. At the end though, we have a boss fight around a giant obelisk, and upon deactivating it, the dungeon experience gets flipped on its head when the ruins begin to collapse and it turns into a mad dash to escape being crushed from all the falling rocks and pillars. It's very easy to get hit in rapid succession by these rolling boulders that can eat a ton of health even if they just tap your toe at half a mile an hour. So spamming health spells as we try to find our way out of an ever-shifting maze of corridors becomes the new name of the game. Despite it feeling a little cheesy, it's a fun segment that has the designers using things we've seen a few times in the game to make a unique experience. We escape to the surface of a now devastated fringe, but at least all the knights are dead, and the forces of order have been foiled for the time being anyway. It's time to head back to Sheogorth and report yet another victory. His investment in us is clearly starting to pay off. With the fringe cleared for now, it's time to secure it permanently by bringing in a new gatekeeper. I really do love this quest, even if it involves the longest and most arduous dungeon crawl we've seen yet. It's just full of neat little segments, particularly the Fortress of Zeselum, where Ralmina works tirelessly to perfect her understanding of her proposed fifth element, flesh. Shergoroth also seems to have a bit of a thing for the crazy powerful mage, possibly because of her power, or possibly because of her sadistic insanity. She may be a big fan of the Mad God, but we probably top her shit list for having killed what she quite seriously thinks of as her child. She's delighted to make a new gatekeeper, but it's a very involved process to make such an indestructible beast. She spent years cultivating the materials necessary to construct them in the Gardens of Flesh and Bones, and that's going to be our next destination. Before that though, it's worth taking a look around her lab, which can best be described as a torture prison befitting some sort of Second World War crime against humanity. She insists everyone sent in here as a volunteer, but uh, I doubt that. All over the place we get to see many of her life experiments and get access to some of her research notes, and they help paint her as a sadistic, if not brilliant, magician. And I gotta give credit to Bethesda here for taking the time to design this place with all these scripted little experiments. It really does wonders to elevate Romina's character and addresses that point I made back during my Mages Guild video where I complained how we never really saw any reason to believe anyone in the Mages Guild actually possessed an ounce of magical talent and were only meant to buy into the whole thing to the name of the guild and the titles those empty NPCs possess. And of course, that didn't work, and led to some of the greatest dissonance I had experienced in the entire game. It wouldn't have taken much for me to buy into Realmina's expertise, especially with what comes later, but this lab just makes this whole segment feel so convincing and end up being just so damn memorable. So it's off to the Gardens of Flesh and Bone, only this time we aren't getting something to kill a gatekeeper, but collecting the four essences needed to construct a new beast. Most of it is just following quest markers through lengthy dungeon quarters. Although the segment for retrieving the Essence of Breath has us following a green mist through a maze of roots to its source, which is a little neat. Back at the lab, Romina, who doesn't seem to be warming up to us in the slightest, instructs us to go pick the parts she has in one of her chambers to construct the new gatekeeper. She made multiples of each appendage, giving us a selection to choose from, and allowing us to basically design the new gatekeeper. Some of these parts will imbue the gatekeeper with certain stat bonuses or resistances, and of course make him look different. 
Doesn't really matter, truth be told. Once he's set loose, we really won't see him again, and his combat effectiveness is completely irrelevant. So feel free to pick what will make him look cool and start making your way to the fringe. Before the Gates of Madness, on the site of where we slew the previous gatekeeper, Relmina has prepared a witch's cistern of sorts for her new creation. In probably the most visually striking sequence in the entire game, we get to help her bring this beast to life. First, place the gatekeeper's body into the cistern of substantiation. Place the gatekeeper's body into the cistern of substantiation. At the beginning of the worlds were five. Fire, water, earth, air, and light. Darkness turned into day. The void took form. Hidden away by virtue of its own self-awareness was the sixth, containing within it the five which birthed it. Flesh! Meat! With the desire to consume like fire, place the dermis membrane into the cistern. Blood, liquid nutrition, that ocean which casts pearls of life on the shores of existence. Place the blood liquor into the cistern of substantiation. Bone, branch, stone of the body, giving shape and structure. Place the osseous marrow into the cistern. Breath, child of air, bestowing movement, the stirring of spirit. Place the essence of breath into the cistern of substantiation. And last, the light of flesh, the illumination of soul, perception, thought, memory, imagination. I summon thee, walker in flesh, flesh of true flesh, from those waters of oblivion which sire thy kind. Come to this altar, join with this body, quintessence of flesh, join with the essence of flesh, absolute, immortal, immortal, bound, contingent. Stand clear of the cistern, over here by me. Honored Daedra, fear not thy abasement. Thou shalt be the holy in this temple. I bind thee, Atronach, to this body. Henceforth, gatekeeper of the Shivering Isles. My child, it is time to fulfill your destiny. Stand guard in this land against all those who seek entry, not bearing the mark of Sheagorath's favor. You shall know them by the coldness of your minds. Darkness of spirit. And just like that, we got ourselves a new gatekeeper. As an added treat, we get to watch the new gatekeeper wreck shop as a group of knights come foolishly to attack him. Back at the palace, we learn Jigalag is getting more desperate and is attempting to use subterfuge to sabotage the forces of the realm. And it's here Shergoroth drops the biggest surprise on us yet. Well, aren't you precious? Do you really not know? Haven't you noodled it all through yet? Because he is me! I'm him! We're a bit of each other, really. I, I won't be here when he arrives, because I'll be him! Happens every time. The Grey March starts, order appears, and I become Jigalag and wipe out my whole realm! So, this explains quite a bit, but also ends up spawning even more nagging questions that we will have to start hunting for the answers to. And I just love plots that do this. Plots that have the player asking questions and hunting down answers are really the best plots. It gets the player truly engaged in the story and the world and the characters. And at this point, I should just keep replaying a soundbite of me saying how this wasn't something we saw in the main game, because I've just run out of unique ways of saying that. Now, it's off to Belrock, the home of the saints, to take care of this surprise attack by the forces of order. It's pretty much a linear dungeon crawl, except we get some allies and environmental puzzles to make it feel a little bit different. But like with all the other dungeon crawls, there just isn't much to say. We learn how the saints and seducers are reborn, and that's really what Belrock is intended function is. It's the place where the saints are reborn at when they are slain after their spirits float through oblivion for a while. The Abyss of Oblivion is apparently a very scary place even for the saints, and so Shergoroth created Belrock and the seducer counterpart Pinnacle Rock, to act as a beacon for his creations as souls to find their ways back to the realm. Order attempts to stop up the wellspring where the saints are reborn, temporarily incapacitating our allies by severing their links to this realm. But with a little persistence and a lot of arrows and spells, the threat is squashed and the day is saved once more. It would seem that Thaden played a hand in this, which is no surprise since Jigalag is not known for coming up with original plans on his own. Back at the palace, things have taken a uh, very unfortunate turn. Immediately we know something is off because Shergoroth isn't sitting in his throne and is without his cane. 
He's left standing off to the side looking like some lost pedestrian, looking around his throne room as long as he doesn't even recognize it anymore. This is something that I noticed with the expansion. Bethesda tried to use more animations outside of conversations to better detail the mental states of their NPCs. It's usually pretty silly and uncanny thanks to the terrible animations their 2006 engine restricted them to. But here with Shea Gorath, the subtle change in his idling animations does nail the trick quite well, I gotta admit. I felt more in the 10 seconds walking up to the throne and sensing something was seriously off than I did during the entire main quest of the base game. That's just effective use of proper storytelling build-up and less is more presentation. I thought we had more time. I thought we had a chance. But plan has failed and we were so close! Optimism! Ha! Oh, ho, ho, ho. How adorable! I love it! Even at the end you make me laugh! <laughs> I'm lying. That wasn't funny at all. No matter. Soon you and everyone else will be dead. And I will be left a mad god. Ruler of a dead realm. Again. What happens is what always has happened. What always will happen. I crumble. I fade. The realm dies. And you with it. Flee while you can, mortal. When we next meet, I will not know you, and I will slay you like the others. I had intended to give you my staff, the symbol of my office, but life is gone from it as it goes from me. It is now dead wood, a useless twig. With the staff, there was hope, now, hope is dead. I am dead. The realm. <laughs> the realm is dead! Sheogorath is dead! All shall crumble before! Man, I really do love this last conversation with Sheogorath. It's a great send-off for the best character this game ever had. It really leaves me wondering if Sheogorath is just an identity like the Grey Fox, or if Sheogorath is a real person. Do different beings that earn the title of Mad God eventually transform into Sheogorath? If so, do they have continuity and memory? Maybe that's the source of the madness, all those personalities of different people who became Sheogorath. Because we aren't the first to become Sheogorath, according to the lore. I wonder these things because, damn, I feel kind of bad if the last thing he will ever experience was the dread that he had failed to save his realm again. Fortunately, we still got our boy Haskell, and while things look grim, he still has a plan and sees this more as a temporary setback and not total defeat. He believes that while we can't become a Daedric Prince, we only merely need to sit on the Throne of Madness and wield the Staff to possess enough power to stop the Grey March. And while the Staff of Shergoroth is dead like the Mad God himself, we can make a new one. The only problem is that this will require us to seek out the only source of knowledge left in the realm that would be able to provide that information to us. We need to go out and seek the Great Library of Jigalag, which had been sealed off by Shergoroth long ago. There's no telling what the library of the enemy might have in store for us, but it really is the only way. So it's off to Knife Point Hollow, which sits at the center of the realm, a short distance inside the ancient ruin. We use a key Haskell gave us to get through a locked door, only to find a man sitting in an empty chamber. It turns out there is no library. Shergorth had the library burned eons ago following the Grey March, considering the library to be an abomination. The library contained the great formula deduced by Jigalag, who is really the Daedric Prince of not only order, but also logic. That logic and that formula allowed him to predict any and all events carried out by all beings, mortal and immortal, for all of time, and that knowledge was recorded in his great library. So we can see why that would irk his chaotic counterpart, and why he would have it destroyed. But Sheogorath couldn't bring himself to destroy all that knowledge forever. 
So we had Dias, who was the immortal keeper of the library, who also lacks no real sense of individuality locked away for all eternity instead. We are the first living thing he has seen in a very long time, though that doesn't seem to interest him one way or another. He knows why we've come, as this has already been deduced a long time ago. He knows how to make the staff, and he tells us exactly what we must collect so we can construct a staff. He expects us to fail, but once again, that doesn't really interest him one way or another. He does admit it would be interesting if we did succeed because we'd be the first mortal ever to have our own dedicated Daedric artifact. So maybe that's why he ends up helping us. Though he doesn't believe in free will, so I guess he doesn't really have a choice in this matter anyhow. Regardless, it's time to do some more dungeon diving. The dungeon crawls are beginning to wear a little thin. As interesting and unique as each dungeon is, at least in comparison to what we've normally seen in Oblivion, they are still just stints of combat meant to pad out the experience and pace out the story some, and this quest begins to show that a little bit too much. It's still much more enjoyable than any of the other dungeon experiences in Cyrodiil, but it does start to feel like it's being dragged out. Our first item to fetch is the Eye of a Zealot Leader Mage in some ruins. This involves fighting past her minions and slaying her, which, simple enough. The second item we need is the branch from one of the main trees in the grove deep in the heart of the Isles. The growth is said to show men who they really are, and only after we see the truth will it give us its branch. The truth just means fighting a shadow version of ourselves, which is an identical copy of ourselves but turned dark and shadowy. Of all the boss fights I've had to fight in this game, this was the most difficult, and uh, what an ego boost that turns out to be. It's great fun fighting something that has every tool and every power you possess, but too bad the limited AI still makes it a very uneven fight. With the items collected, it's back to DS to get our staff. He's quite surprised by our success and very casually mentions that there must be an error in his calculation. You know, the calculation that had successfully predicted every action and every outcome of every action for all of recorded history thus far. You know, no big deal. He gives us our unpowered staff and tells us to soak it in the font of madness back at the palace. So we return with our big stick looking to soak it in the fountain behind the throne, but when we get there we see it isn't working, and white shards of order are surrounding the fountain. Haskell admits we have a new problem on our hands. The forces of order must have found a way to taint the waters of madness themselves, which is fed by the great tree deep beneath the surface of the isles where the madness of the residents of the realm resides. This is the true source of madness for the realm, and if the forces of order manage to find a way to clog that up, then Jigalag has pretty much already won. He suspects Thaden once again, because this is just far too imaginative for the Daedric Prince himself. If that's the case, then the only solution is to head down into the fountainhead and find the source of the taint and eliminate it. Ordinarily, it's a peaceful place down there where the tame gnarls tend to the roots of the great trees, but with order down there, who knows what might be going on. The gnarls themselves might be helping to spread that taint. So, it's time for our final dungeon dive, and unfortunately, it's the most uninspired of them all. We got to conjure up some friendly gnarls to open some doors for us, but other than that, there's little going on down here except fighting the same monsters we've been fighting since the beginning, and the occasional mini-boss fight between a few knights and a priest. Killing the priest slowly lets us cleanse the place of the taint as we move through the dungeon. The way too long dungeon crawl comes to an end with a boss fight with some priests and Thaden around a large obelisk in the Waters of Madness. Or at least, it's meant to be a boss fight, but High Sneak and High Marksman kinda ends the fight before they ever even had a chance to defend themselves. We head back up with some fat dungeon loot and finally get to soak our staff, gaining the power of Sheogorath. And not a moment too soon as one of our guard commanders comes running up alerting us to the latest development. Order is finally assaulting the palace as obelisks around the palace grounds are beginning to activate and the forces of Jigalag are now spawning in. It's time for the final battle and to put a stop to the Grey March and break this cycle forever. It's here the power of the staff of Sheogorath comes in super fucking handy as it allows us to freeze everyone, friend and foe alike, for 15 seconds in an area. This gives us all the time in the world to overload the obelisks with hearts of order to stop the knights from spawning. Eventually, Jigalag gets sick of our shit and comes down to the battle himself. And well, let's just say our shadow put up a bigger fight. Enough! I am beaten. 
The Grey March is ended. For the millennia, this drama has unfolded, and each time I have conquered this land, only to be transformed back into that gibbering fool, Shadowboran. It was not always so. Once I ruled this realm, the world of perfect order. My dominion expanded across the seas of oblivion with each passing error. The other princes, fearful of my power, cursed me with madness, doomed me to live as Sheoghora, a broken soul reigning in a broken land. Once each era, I was allowed my true form, conquering this world anew. And each time I did, the curse was renewed, damning me to exist as Sheoghora. Now, though, you have ended the cycle. You now hold the mantle of madness, and Jigalag is free to roam the voids of oblivion once more. I will take my leave, and you will remain here, mortal. Mortal, king, god, it seems uncertain. This realm is yours. Perhaps you will grow to your station. Fare thee well, Shinobura, prince of madness. With us breaking the cycle, the curse has finally been lifted, and with it we are now Sheo Gorath, and Jigalag is free to roam oblivion in his true form once more. He ponders what we truly are now, thanking us regardless, and that's pretty much it. Back inside the palace, we see Haskell has already assembled our new court and welcomes us officially as Sheo Gorath, Prince of the Shivering Isles. We learn what all this means and what benefits and responsibility we now possess. And, well, this is the greatest failing of this questline. There just isn't much we get. We can go to the court and use some of the services there. We can ask one of the guards to accompany us, as if combat in this game wasn't easy enough already. And that's pretty much it. We get to keep the staff, and we can change the weather of the realm, which nets us different buffs, but really, that's it. As for our responsibilities, it's just unending quests that presumably send us to go kill some monsters that can just as easily be ignored, not really making them obligations at all. This is absolutely one of those cases of it's the journey and not the destination, as the rewards for becoming what's basically the closest thing a mortal can get to becoming a god in this universe are really just underwhelming. That's another reason I like to make this one of the last things I do with any character. It seems fitting for any of my characters standing in the court just crowned as the god of madness. Rewards don't really matter if I'm done playing, and I get the feeling Bethesda understood that this was going to be the way a lot of players went through this expansion, especially since it came out way past the original game's launch. But this is all starting to sound like a conclusion, which calls for another chapter transition first. Ah, that's better. There's something truly poetic about the player becoming the Lord of Madness. We seem to act like agents of madness already, so to have that officially recognized is pretty nice. By this point, we've basically been elevated to something close to an emperor as the champions of Cyrodiil. We've become the Grand Champion of the Arena, the Archmage of the Mages Guild, the Guildmaster of the Fighters Guild, the Grey Fox, the Listener of the Dark Brotherhood, and the Favored Champion of every Daedric Prince. So why not ascend to Godhood? The Shivering Isles experience is very enjoyable from start to finish. It's perhaps the most consistent questline in the whole game. It starts to drag just a bit near the end, but by then the momentum of the story carries us to the end and it left me wanting more. No other quest chain had me wanting it to continue. They all either dragged out way too long, or ended at the perfect point for me to have my fill. The Shivering Isles all in all adds about another 20 hours of content, and very little feels like uninspired filler like a lot of the content of the base game. The dungeons all feel like there was a great deal more thought put into them, the quests usually have interesting and engaging characters, most activities yield appropriate rewards, exploring the Isles is just as enjoyable as Cyrodiil, it's a worthy expansion that improves upon almost every aspect of the base game. And that's not to say my time in Cyrodiil is bad, I still love the base game, but the Shivering Isles definitely upstages it in some regards. It's much narrower in scope, sure, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Really though, the areas of improvement that shine the most are in regards to setting and story. The Isles are a brilliant and imaginative location, much more so than most of Cyrodiil, filled with thought out NPCs and enemies that are full of charm and character. They use pre-established lore and a ton of new lore to explain the world and provide ample context. This lore sets us up with some of the biggest mysteries in a whole expansion that is about mystery and discovery. The story itself centralizes all of this to create an actually engaging story that has us actually interacting with the world, learning why it is the way it is and making us care about the fate of it. It gives us an actual stake in this realm and a meaningful role to play within it. Maybe ending up becoming something of a god is a bit over the top, but seeing as we can become the head of every single major faction in the base game, what difference does it really make? 
At least we knew this was coming early on in the story. Our journey through the story is just as much about us saving the realm as it is growing into the role of Sheogorath. No questline had us essentially training to assume the top leadership position. It was always just handed to us like some meaningless trinket, and it pretty much always felt like that was the case too following the completion of those questlines. In terms of gameplay design, the Shivering Isles didn't go about reinventing the systems, but instead just found new ways of recontextualizing those systems to create a more engaging experience. We got to fight alongside allies more frequently to make us feel like we were in fact in charge and wielding some legitimate power. Enemies were given more diverse means of offense and defense, necessitating more creative approaches towards combat. Dungeons frequently had different objectives, or played with enemy placement and behaviors so that we were at least going through each dungeon slightly differently. They still used dungeons to make up for the ever-problematic question of how do we make something any player can enjoy, but they at least tried to make those dungeon experiences not so monotonous. All in all, this expansion was something that, while I didn't think Oblivion absolutely needed to correct all the faults of the base game, definitely benefits from having anyway. It's a wonderful and truly enjoyable experience and I just cannot recommend it enough. I really wish developers put this much effort into DLC these days, because of all the ones I've played over the years, nothing even comes close to what Bethesda did with this one. It truly is something special. But before we go, I think it's appropriate to at least briefly mention some of the other DLCs they had made for this game, at least for the sake of brevity. So let's do one of those title changes again and very briefly cover some of that. There are 10 official plugins Bethesda made for Oblivion. Because this was back when DLC was still a very new concept, the range in scope and quality is just staggering. Most of these plugins are just player-owned houses, while some of them, like Horse Armor and Spell Tome, should have just been added in a patch or bundled in with one of the other DLCs. I'm going to ignore those though because this isn't a video about touring the houses of Oblivion. So that leaves four plugins that add quest content. The Shivering Isles, the Knights of the Nine, the Hunt for Magrin's Racer, and Repairing the Orrery. Shivering Isles we covered, so let's knock out the remaining three and call it quits. To eliminate the low-hanging fruit first, the Orrery is the most bog-standard fetch and delivery quest imaginable. We learn of the quest the moment we step into the sewers after the Emperor is assassinated all the way in the beginning of the game. Then it's just a matter of making the Repairing the Orrery quest our active quest, following the quest markers to the remote bandit camps in the wilderness, killing the two bandits at each, looting the quest items off their bodies, and returning them to Bothiel at the Imperial City Arcane University. We give her a couple of days to do the repairs, and then we got a functioning orrery that lets us receive certain greater powers based on the celestial objects in the sky. That's entirely it. Mayrun's Razor adds a single dungeon in the Volus Mountains on the border of Morrowind and Cyrodiil. The story of the thing goes like this. Some crazy Dunmore warlord is building an army to try and invade Cyrodiil, and it is also hunting for the dagger. The dungeon is quite unique and fun to explore, and the mercenaries inside are loaded up on some of the finest gear level scaling loot tables can provide. And honestly, that alone makes it worth doing the DLC. Forget the dagger at the end, look at all these fucking arrows I walked out with. Which did help make the Shivering Isles a little easier. Eventually we hit a vampire segment, then we kill the warlord and Mayrun Dagon's his champion, and somehow earn Dagon's favor despite being the only reason he got his ass kicked off of Tamriel. It's mercifully brief and simple though, so who really cares? Knights of the Nine though. Oh boy, Knights of the Nine. What can I really say about this expansion? Because that's what Bethesda said it was, an expansion. I don't really know what it expanded, as all it really seemed to add was a couple of broken dungeons and a set of divine armor whose stats are anything but divine. And I say the dungeons are broken because the chests inside them aren't level scaled. At least in my game. So, looting chests was pointless because I was using a level 1 loot table when I was almost level 30 by the time I was doing this. The enemies are scaled, but not the rewards, so have fun grinding through long maze-like dungeons that we've seen a trillion times and getting no worthwhile rewards. Your best bet is running through them or sneaking through them. Forget fighting, it just doesn't enhance the experience any. Our quest starts in Anvil, where the chapel has been desecrated by some unknown forces. The prophet raving outside the chapel seems to think this is the work of Umarel the Unfettered, and is very put off by us not knowing who that even is. He's almost unimpressed by our collection of titles when he asks us why we believe we are worthy to follow the path to seek the blessings of the Eight. 
Eventually, he capitulates after we tell him we are the listener of the Black Hand, and shits out a whole long-winded story full of really uninspired theological buzzwords and vaguely familiar proper nouns. We are then sent on a pilgrimage to redeem ourselves of our sins, because at this point we got quite a few in needing of repenting. And then we will be allowed to rebuild the old wayward order of the religious knights. It is a whole drawn out segment that has us sparring with nine ghosts and listening to them whisper even more meaningless proper nouns before we get sent on some lame fetch quests. A couple of them involve us solving some mini game like puzzles in the middle of undead infested ruins because, you know, we just needed more of them. Each fetch quest is meant to embody the principles of the respective deity. Kinnereth has us respecting nature by not killing a bear in a grove. Stendar has us redeeming the descendant of a man who killed a beggar in the God of Mercy's chapel, and you get the picture. It's cool getting introduced to the gods in a more tangible way than anything else in the base game, especially since we got to know the Daedric Princes pretty well from their shrines. But even the best of these quests are only good because they are short and simple. Most of them are just shitty dungeon crawls to get a reward that isn't even worth equipping for most players. All of this is to assemble every Crusader relic so we can go and kill Umaril. Except, I forgot to bring most of these items with us to Umaril's hideout, so we had to fight him the conventional way. And it was just a fucking cakewalk. Then we just use the Blessing of Talos, which is just a spell we can cast on ourselves, to then be teleported to the Sky Realm where Umaril's spirit needs to be killed to vanquish him forever. Once again, he falls even faster without any of the divine weapons or armor. So, uh, the entire quest chain involved fetching items we didn't even need. Awesome. In the end, we redeemed the corrupted Knights of the Nine, rebuilding it and restocking it with generic NPCs who just got their positions because they approached and asked to join, and we said yes because, well, why wouldn't we? They are surprised and delighted to see us alive because we were dead when they found us. One of them delivers a stirring speech, and I'll just let the events of this epilogue do the talking. Today we have witnessed undeniable proof of the strength and the might of the gods we serve. Slain in battle with the dread Umaro, by the grace and mercy of the Nine, the Crusader lives again. How can this be, you ask? What of our foe? What has become of Umaro the Unfeathered? Umaro has been slain by the Crusader, his very spirit cast into the void and destroyed for all eternity. He will never rise again. Let us give thanks to the, the nine. nine by their Knights power. Of the nine. And the nine. And the nine. Knights of the Nine is just everything wrong and bad in Oblivion bundled into a concentrated dose of boring, pointless tedium. It's really no wonder I had no desire whatsoever to return to it after I played it the first time back in the day. Just do yourself a favor and skip it unless the items are good for your build or something. And that's it. That's every DLC in Oblivion now covered. And with that, I think we've pretty much covered all of the game content worth discussing, really. It's hard to believe it, but this is pretty much the end of the road for Oblivion. I got just one last video in the hopper to wrap this absurdly long series up, so stick around for that. Do the things, or don't, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one where we will finally put Oblivion to bed.